Live from Singapore, welcome to a new show, diving deeper into the stories that matter with crucial context and sharp analysis. This is Insight with me, Haslinda Amin. Bonds hold their losses while equities struggle in Asia. Risk appetite remaining subdued as investors weigh a slower pace of Fed rate cuts. We hear exclusively from the Bank of Thailand governor on why the markets should not take rate cuts for granted just because he surprised them with one last week. Given that we just recalibrated, I think the bar for, for taking um, further uh, rate moves is, is, has to be reasonably uh, high. Also ahead, UBS Global Wealth Management Apex CIO joins us with her view that technology stocks are the way to go as she sees the rally broadening beyond the MAX 7. And we speak to Ayala Corp President Cesar Consing about his plans to cash in on GCash, selling a stake in the fintech venture to Mitsubishi for close to $320 million. Well, a bit of caution in the markets with U.S. 10-year yields hovering around 4.2% after an aggressive sell-off earlier in the week. Investors are increasingly pulling back on bets the Fed will deliver big rate cuts in the coming months. The U.S. economy is still chugging along while many Fed officials this week have been sounding a more cautious tone on cuts. That's also being echoed by Bank of America CEO Brian Monaghan speaking with us exclusively earlier. So we've got to get back in line. And so they're, they're on that path. They were late to the game. They've got to make sure they don't go too hard now. And that's what they are all trying to figure out watching the data. Well, we'll have more from Monaghan just a little later. For now, though, our guest is advising investors to position in Asia investment-grade bonds because of that potential volatility in the U.S. Let's bring in Tan Min Lan, head of Apex CIO at UBS Global Wealth Management. Min Lan, good to have you with us. The big question is what the Fed will do. We see how uh, yields are trending higher, 4.2. People say it'll get to 5 in no time. Do you agree? No, actually, if you look at what has happened in the last couple of days, the market certainly has been repricing the, the odds of a Trump win, and therefore the bond yield, we think, has ticked up and the US dollar has been stronger. But if you, if you were to take a step back, um, year to date, the 10-year bond yield has traded in the range of uh, the low of 3.6 and the high of, let's say, 4.6. Today, we are at 4.2. Now, our view is that the Fed will continue to cut. Uh, simply because inflation is coming down closer to target and the current rate, it's well above the neutral rate um, of, of, of the economy. Um, and as the easing cycle continues, we do think that the bond yield will dip down below 10, uh, uh, below 4 uh, again uh, to, towards the end of this year. So in, in that regard, we actually do think that cash rates will continue to fall um, and at the same time, we will take the sell off really as an opportunity to re-engage in some of the, especially in the investment grade um, uh, part um, of, 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 of the um, uh, credit market. Might the US election results change the assumptions you're making right now? What if we get a really close race, where might yields be? Yeah, you know, our, our view on the election has been um, that it will be determined at the margin, the race is going to be clo too close to call, and therefore rates volatility is going to be high going into the election. Um, and in fact, you know, it's, all, it's also possible that we don't have a very clear outcome if there is contest and there are recounts. So volatility is going to be there. Um, but if you take a 6 to 12 months view, we do think that the election outcome is not going to meaningfully derail fundamentals. And the fundamentals really is that we think the Fed is going to uh, be easing into a very decent uh, market. So from, from that perspective, we, we still think that um, so long as the Fed cut, um, the 10 year bond yield actually will start to settle down again. And that would be the impetus for the stock rally to continue. How much higher can it go? Some are already saying perhaps, what, 6,000 by the end of this year and 8,000 by the end of the decade. How do you play this market? Yeah, um, actually, 
equities is in the sweet spot because you do have an economy that is strong. Um, since 2019, the U.S. growth has been averaging around 2.5% per annum. And this is well above the so-called trend rate of about one8 So that's probably the reason why growth has been strong and inflation actually has been quite well behaved. It's moving towards the uh, Fed's target. So if you have the um, uh, rates that are falling, the economy that is quite strong, we, we do think that it is an environment that is positive uh, for equities. Um, so we are we are positive on U.S. stocks. Um, we think that um, high single-digit returns um, uh, in, into the middle of next year is is certainly plausible. What's the risk to that, though? What's the risk to your projection? Um, the risk, obviously, it's if inflation comes back, if Trump is very aggressive with his tariffs and he can actually uh, implement that, um, then inflation can 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 pick up. The uh, bond yield will start to move up, especially at the longer end. Mm -hmm. um, that certainly would be a disruption um, to the benign environment that 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 we um, think will prevail. Um, I, I I think that the point about the election is this: um, a, a lot depends on. Um, what can be implemented by the new administration. Uh, a lot also depends on the sequencing of policy events. Is he going to cut taxes first before, let's say Trump wins, he's going to cut taxes first before he raised tariffs? Um, are, are those tariffs just a bargaining um, uh, chip or is he really going to implement them? And also the other thing is also depends on the reaction of the trading partners. For, for example, a very large Trump um, uh, tariffs or punitive tariffs could be met with much stronger Chinese stimulus as well. So, so it's, it's difficult to actually kind of like take singular positions uh, on markets based on specific e election outcome. Instead, what we do, focus on the fundamentals, which we think is positive, and then you hatched the tail risk. Um, so, for example, we're still positive on gold. Um, we, 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 we do think that the um, uh, Chinese stimulus are for real, but we are not overweight the Chinese market simply because of the election risk. Before we touch on China, you are bullish tech. There are suggestions out there that the rally will broaden beyond MAX 7. How do you play it? Where do you put your money in the tech space? Yeah, we are, we are most positive on uh, um, U.S. tech at this point in time. Um, but the area that we are um, um, most uh, bullish on is really on AI semis. So from our perspective, the GPUs, the uh, custom chips, the uh, high bandwidth memory, so, so those are the areas that, that we think uh, will continue to be um, seeing, seeing, seeing strong uh, investment. In, in fact, if we look at the latest results, comments from TSMC, they're basically saying that we are at the very early stage of an AI cycle. So from that perspective, we do see the uh, applications broadening out and therefore uh, benefiting the broader tech sector as well. How about China? Are you seeing a reversal in terms of sentiment towards China? People say that when it comes to uh, fiscal stimulus, the amount to be looking at is 10 trillion yuan. We are close to that, depending on how you do your calculation. Is that the tipping point? Are we going to see a turnaround in terms of sentiment, in terms of the markets in China? Now, my sense on China is this. I think a major pivot is definitely underway. Uh, what hasn't changed is the strategic intent to reshape the economic uh, model, to plug the gap left by property-related uh, industries with high-end manufacturing. Uh, but what has changed is that there is now a policy consensus that they have to, they have to curtail the current deflationary spiral in order to achieve those uh, strategic objectives. Um, and therefore, we are seeing measures to recap the state bank, to relieve local government debt. We are also seeing fiscal support for the property market and also for the stock market. Um, now, to, to, to your point, I mean, how big is this, this all these measures going to um, add up to? Um, I think it will remain a matter of much speculation. The way I think about it is that they will do enough to ensure that growth is sustained at a run rate of 5%, not just for this year, but into 2027, in order to achieve their strategic transformation uh, of the economy. Um, and, 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 and the big pivot, it's really in the policy consensus that they have to break. They have to break this deflationary cycle with uh, forceful policies. Where are the opportunities? Valuations are still very low. It's up 17% since um, stimulus were introduced. It's given up some of those gains before. Yeah. Where would you put your money in China? 
So, um, it, you know, by, by the middle of next year, we think that the market probably could go up uh, by amount uh, by 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 mid teens uh, percent, this is backed by perhaps nine to ten percent uh, earnings growth and also valuation slightly higher than the current ten point four times uh, forward PE. Um, so we, we we do think that um, the 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 market is on the up, but I have to say that we are not outright overweight in China. Um, instead. Um, we have preferred to play it via an overweight on Asia x Japan equities because that allows us to benefit from the China stimulus but importantly it, it allows us to express our positive views on IT mm -hmm. especially on AI semis both in Taiwan as well in Korea and also the uh, structural growth that we think will will uh, be ongoing in uh, uh, India as well. But to your question, within China itself, uh, we do like the um, uh, Chinese internet stock. Uh, we do think that the shareholder returns uh, policies will be intact going into this uh, reporting season. Um, and they, are, they have been seeing uh, better margins and better mix, which we think will continue. Is China benefiting? at the expense of India? Should we be unwinding that long India position? We've seen how that rotation has been happening. Will that be sustained? Well, I, I mean, to, to be fair, um, in India has kind of like, um, the, the market has softened about 5 to 6 percent from a uh, recent peak. Part of it is certainly because of the revival in China. But India itself has also been seeing a period of uh, a soft patch uh, in growth and in earnings. Uh, which we think is transitory. Um, I mean, the, the uh, weather conditions has been bad uh, because of the election. There's been a slowdown in government spending. Um, so growth will resume, um, not at 8%, but closer to 7%. So making it still one of the fastest, as the fastest uh, growing economy in G20. So from that perspective, we do think that this is a market where investors should continue to kind of like um, um, increase allocation. Um, the, the reason is because... How should that portfolio look like? How much should be in India? How much would be in China? What kind of allocation are we looking at? I mean, if we, if we, we, if we look at benchmark weight, for example, in India is now 22% of the Asia x Japan um, uh, index, just marginally smaller than uh, uh, China. Um, from a perspective of private uh, foreign investors, I can tell you that the allocation into in, into India it's 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 minuscule scale, and and a lot of that is because uh, direct market access is is difficult, and India never traded as a cheap market. Um, so over time, like in periods like this where there is a setback in the market, we, we think it's a good opportunity to be raising foundational or strategic asset allocation so into the, the market. Buy the dip. All right, Min Lan, thank you so much for joining us. Tan Min Lan of UBS Global Wealth Management. Still to come, our exclusive interview with the Bank of Thailand Governor Sataput Sutiwarna Raput after the Central Bank surprised with its first rate cut in more than four years. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Thailand Central Bank Chief has signaled that policymakers won't be rushing to follow up on last week's interest rate cut. Governor Sataput Sutiwa Naraput told me exclusively that future actions will be guided by the outlook for inflation and financial stability. He also said last week's cut should not have come as a surprise to markets. We were surprised by, by the extent to which the markets were surprised because we had, if you look at our previous statements and the edited minutes and whatnot, I think the Monetary Policy Committee had conveyed their concerns about financial stability and financial conditions. And we'd always, always emphasized that we were very um, uh, much uh, outlook dependent and that if there were changes in the outlook that, that we would, we would um, undertake uh, measures. And, and, if you, and if you look at, again, the, the, um, the, the reasons underlying for, uh, the, the decision for the cut, um, by and large, they were uh, uh, reflecting the fact that uh, financial conditions had tightened, so we felt that financial stability risks were lower and that um, uh, a cut, a cut was, was warranted. Um, and it was motivated that much more than, again, any changes to the growth or inflation outlook, which basically were, were in line with what we had um, been anticipating. Uh, would you say you're, you're done with cutting rates for the year, at least? 
No, I, I don't want to um, prejudge uh, anything, uh, Hasland. Uh, but again, um, uh, as I, we tried to emphasize in, in, in the minutes, um, we, we felt that this was um, um, uh, a recalibration that was appropriate given, given the tightening financial conditions. Um, but it does not signal um, the beginnings of an extended uh, easing cycle. Um, and, uh, and that, again, I think in the statement, we also flagged that the, um, we felt that uh, keeping rates too low um, would also uh, create unnecessary risks. So I think, uh, and, and given that we just recalibrated, I think the bar for, for taking um, further uh, rate moves is, is, has to be reasonably uh, high. Um, so, but again, uh, that's not to prejudge anything. Uh, we will continue to be guided again by the outlook and changes of the outlook. Mm. Uh, Governor, the government has also taken issue with uh, the inflation target currently standing at 1% to 3%. Might you consider moderating or perhaps moving it a little bit, a slight moderation perhaps? Yeah, the inflation target is something that we have to agree with by law with the government. And so we are looking forward to having that conversation with them. But uh, I think it's important to point out that inflation target, uh, as it stands, has, has, has served us quite well. Um, um, we have, again, a flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, the inflation uh, band is 1% to 3%. And if you look at, at, at what we've got out of that, um, it's kept inflation expectations uh, anchored quite well all throughout the whole uh, inflation spike that we saw um, uh, with, with COVID and, and the Ukraine situation. Um, inflation in Thailand, again, went up to 8%, uh, but then it, we had fairly rapid disinflation. Uh, it brought it back down within our target range in about seven mm. months, which, which is a, a very rapid for, for um, uh, compared to, to other countries. And again, all throughout that, that period, the inflation expectations were, were remained anchored within the target range. And, and, and that, that anchoring of inflation expectations allowed us to, to take a much more, uh, again, what we were calling a gradual measured approach towards um, uh, rate adjustments. So we didn't need to jack up rates as high uh, um, as, as we saw in other countries. We didn't need to go um, to move rates as far into restrictive territory as, as other countries might have had to do. Um, and so I think the, the inflation targeting regime uh, has served as well to keep inflation uh, low, uh, stable, and and, um, uh, and 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 again anchored. A modest moderation wouldn't hurt, would it? If you take a look at Indonesia, for example, one and a half to three and a half percent. We have uh, the Philippines, two to four percent. A modest moderation might work or not. Um, inflation, low inflation, I think you know is is something that people want. Um, you look at cost of living, uh, even though inflation has rates have come down, uh, the cost of living has gone up because uh, obviously the price levels have come up. But just because inflation comes down doesn't mean that the price levels have come down. So I think, um, you know, uh, people, you know, uh, don't necessarily want to see um, and the economy just certainly doesn't uh, benefit from having necessarily higher inflation. Um, so uh, provided, again, uh, uh, that you don't get in a situation of, of, of deflation. Um, but again, there are very, very few signs of that uh, in, in, in Thailand. Um, um, even though we've had inflation come in at below target, uh, again, there are relatively few signs that, that this has resulted in broader uh, deflation. We haven't seen consumption you know, uh, drop off a cliff because people expect prices to go down. We haven't seen a wage price uh, spiral downwards. We haven't seen any of that. We, we haven't seen inflation expectations become unanchored. So keep inflation, uh, again, low and stable is, I think, the main um, uh, outcome, the reason that we have this inflation targeting regime. And, and again, uh, it's managed to deliver, it, that, deliver that quite well. Um, trying to move the band, um, if, that, if you move the band and move the band upwards, and that causes inflation expectations to, um, to, to go up, then actual inflation would go up. Cost of living will go up. Uh, bond yields, borrowing costs, all that stuff will also go up. Uh, we've seen the ripple effects from China's slowdown. China exporting its deflation is one concern. How is that impacting Thailand? How are you looking at that? Yeah, China is impacting, I think, um, Thailand and other economies in the region quite, quite significantly. Um, <clears throat> there's a direct impact in terms of a slowdown in China that affects our exports to China affects uh, the tourists that come to, 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 to Thailand and how much they spend. But we're seeing increasingly indirect effects as well. Uh, we're seeing um, that uh, with the slowdown in China, the, um, the stuff that they produce, they can't sell, so they export that out um, to countries uh, around the region, including Thailand. So we've seen 
imports from China increase very rapidly. We've seen uh, our trade deficit with China increase uh, significantly as well. And we've seen our exports to third markets been affected by, again, um, these, these increased Chinese goods uh, in, in other countries in, in key export sectors for us, like uh, petrochemicals, uh, automotive, um, uh, and, and also in terms of um, uh, imports coming to Thailand, construction materials. Is there anything policymakers should be doing, you think? I mean, at what point should policymakers consider perhaps imposing tariffs? Uh, I think the tariff decision is a... Is a is a big and way, uh, one fraught with a lot of implications. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, already there is sufficient turmoil on the trade front. Um, the last thing I think that the world needs, given all the uncertainty and whatnot that's happening, is, is, is you know, things that would exacerbate the trade conflicts. Um, so, I, again, which is a situation that um, uh, doesn't benefit in, anyone if we see a, a sharp slowdown in trade. So I think uh, those kinds of decisions need to be taken very, very carefully. The BART has seen a turnaround, one of the best performers in Asia this year. You've said before there's no specific target for the currency. Are you concerned, though, that in the lead-up to the U.S. election, you may see wild swings in the currency? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been, the volatility of the currency is, has, has been very high, the bot. Um, typically, uh, previously, we, we, the volatility of the bot was closer to the other ASEAN comparators, but recently it's um, edged up, and now the, bot, the volatility of the bot is getting closer to that of, say, the more volatile currencies in the region, like the Korean won or the Japanese yen. So, um, yeah, a lot of that's driven by what's happening in the advanced economies, but uh, coupled with um, Thai-specific factors. Um, one thing is, again, the uh, Thai economy is seen as being very linked and very close to what happens with China. So when there's news about China, that affects the currency's volatility. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's been an issue for us because, again, we're a very um, open economy, um, exports and tourism, big chunk of our GDP. And uh, a lot of those firms in those two sectors are, are SMEs, um, uh, exports, exporters, for example, um, are a lot of SMEs there, and, and they don't hedge as much as, as we would like them to do. And so they get, they get hit and get affected very much by the, by the um, volatility of the currency. So it is a, it is, it is a concern. Uh, you're in D.C. where settled bankers, policymakers are gathering uh, for the IMF meeting. Of course, front and center, the U.S. election as well as the Fed. Uh, I, I'm just wondering what assumptions you're making about whether or not the Fed can navigate a soft lending. Um, our, you know, our, our own read is, is again, that, that the U.S. economy is, 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 in, a, is in a reasonably um, um, health, healthy state. So um, our, our baseline assumptions are, are, are for a, a, a soft landing in the United States. Um, I think uh, the, the real issue now is, is more about the, um, the uncertainty uh, regarding uh, the, what, what's going to happen on the policy front following the elections. I think everybody is waiting on that. Bank of Thailand Governor Setaput Suti Varna Rupit is speaking to us exclusively. Let's do a check on how Asian currencies are doing. It is about the dollar pretty steady, putting uh, some pressure on Asian currencies, uh, emerging uh, markets in particular. Take a look where we are in terms of the Thai baht, 33.602, currently down three tenths of one percent. Remember, this is one currency that's uh, been pretty strong, up uh, two percent on the year versus the USD, among the best performers in Asia. We're also keeping an eye on the Japanese yen 151.79 versus the USD. The next level we're looking at is 152.77. Coming up, our exclusive interview with the CEO of the Philippines' largest conglomerate, Ayala, who discussed a deal with Mitsubishi. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching Insight. Bank of America CEO Brian Monahan is calling on the Fed to not go too hard on rate cuts. He was speaking exclusively with Bloomberg during his first visit to Australia, where the bank is marking 60 years of business. 
we not only have all the, the general economic work, we have the top research team in the business. We, they do a great job, Candace Browning Platt leading them and all the colleagues around the world. But we also have is 60 million American consumers. And so we think about the U.S. economy, we have great insight into what's going on. If you look at that consumer spending this year, uh, the month of October so far versus last year or third quarter versus last year's third quarter, it's up in the four to five percent range, which is consistent with a low inflation, low growth economy. That's across about a trillion and a quarter dollars to trillion and a half dollars spent in a quarter. So it's a big sample and the people moving around, they spend it each quarter on all different things, but it's generally growing consistent where we were pre-pandemic when you had you know, Fed funds rate at the 2% level, 2.5% level, you had inflation and control and you had growth in the 2% level. So that, that gives us confidence that our experts to do all analysis are backed up by the data we see in our clients. And, the, and that's what we see. For the consumer, is, it, is there a degree of bifurcation there demographically? It's 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 less about bifurcation because I'd assume that there's sort of two. It's yeah. it, look, inflation hits people uh, uh, in the lower income brackets more than it does others because. But the good news is gas prices have come down, food prices have tipped over, inflation's in control. It's down in the three percent range as opposed to it was running pretty hot, and so that helps. But. But if you have auto debt, that debt, and you want to get a new car, that debt is higher. If you have mortgage debt and you already had a mortgage loan, it's very low. And so it really depends on the consumer and really where they are. But the average American consumer has more money than they did before the pandemic, is in better credit quality before the pandemic, still has the money in accounts from some of this uh, stimulus in the pandemic, and is spending money. And that's all good stuff for the U.S. economy because we're such a consumer. That's the unique thing about it. It's a consumer-driven economy. It's a consumer-led economy. Are you thinking about making allocations or allowances for stress at this point? We always do that. So every quarter we run stress tests, you know, thousands of them. Every day we run them in the markets, business stuff. We always look at it. And so what's the case if it turns out the, the wrong way? So even how we set our reserves, we, we have a modeled uh, series of cases we put in. So it's not all base case. Base case is about half. And the rest are stress cases and you add them all together. We're actually set our reserves as if unemployment was going to be at 5% at the end of next year, not what the market predicts at 4.3. So there's a conservatism built in to that. And then we look beyond that. There's also some... Uh, potential complications for the Fed depending on what happens in just under two weeks time right does the fiscal scenario particularly under another Trump administration but also certainly there are risks when it comes to the Harris camp as well is that something that you're thinking about so I would separate a very near-term question of the Fed getting the trajectory our experts have them cutting again a couple more times this year so 100 basis points this year and another 100 basis points more evenly spread a quarter each quarter next year and gets to 3 to 3.25 as a terminal rate and then inflation comes down to the 2.3 percent as we move into 25 and the 26 and so that is a, a well-engineered uh, Fed change and so the danger is that data or they go too fast or too slow and that risk is higher now than it was six months ago and so as they move the, everybody's going to watch them and you see the self and treasuries one day and you see the rally the other day everybody's going to watch all that and that was bank of america ceo brian monahan speaking exclusively with bloomberg's heidi strunk watts now to the philippines ayala corp is the oldest and largest conglomerate in the nation the company's business interests include real estate financial services water and telecommunications it's just announced it's selling 50 percent of its ac ventures unit to japan's mitsubishi for almost 320 million dollars ac ventures owns a 13 percent stake in globe fintech innovation the company behind the Philippines' mobile payments leader, Gcash. A large chunk of the nation's estimated 112 million population have no bank accounts, and Gcash has some 94 million registered users. Mitsubishi believes that makes the Philippines an attractive market with significant room for growth in digital financial services. Joining us exclusively, Cesar Consing, President and CEO of Ayala Cobb. Bong, good to have you with us. Before we get to the state of business, we know that uh, uh, Storm Trami is gaining momentum there in the Philippines. Uh, probably uh, people are staying home. We know that FX trading has been suspended. Stock trading, though, continues. Give us a sense of uh, the situation on the ground there. Anything to be worried about? I, I think we're, we'll be fine here, as, as Linda. The government gave everybody uh, early notice, uh, so uh, the kids stayed at home from, from school, and, and, and uh, some of the office workers stayed home. Uh, we're doing a much better job of giving people early warning. Uh, but what strikes me about, about Trami is, you know, these, these big storms happen later and later in the year. 
in the Philippines. I remember there was a time when we had a rainy right. season, and that rainy season was much earlier in the year. So, so obviously, mm. there's, there's climate change afoot here. Yeah, you've got to take care of that. Let's talk about business. We talk about that deal with Mitsubishi paying uh, more than $300 million. Talk to us about the investment opportunities with uh, Mitsubishi. Well, Mitsubishi has been a long-term partner of Ayala. We've just celebrated uh, 50 years. And, uh, you know, some, some time back, they started lightening up on their exposure to the parent, Ayala Corp. Uh, but what they decided to do is look for opportunities in our business units uh, to make investments. And you see one here where they've decided uh, to make an investment in AC Ventures. Now, AC Ventures happens to own uh, uh, a, a block, 13 percent of, of, of Mint, which is the, the leading uh, e-wallet fintech company in the country. And that's, that's a $320 million deal. That's, 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 that's a large deal. Uh, for anyone, and, and Mitsubishi was very happy to do that. And Mitsubishi is doing that at the same time that MUFG, uh, the largest uh, uh, Japanese bank, is also has also made uh, or in the process of making a an investment in eight uh, percent of, of, of Mint. So uh, you see Mint here, which is attracting uh, the largest Japanese bank and probably the largest uh, Japanese trading company. It's it's a but it's a real vote of confidence. Other, what other investment opportunities do you see with Mitsubishi? Might that be in the form of real estate, energy, uh, auto dealership? What else might you see? It's, it, it can come in the form of our health business. It can come in, the, in, in our infrastructure business. It can come in real estate. Uh, we've done a dozen or more deals with Mitsubishi over the last uh, several decades. And they've, 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 they've been in industrial parks, they've been in real estate, uh, they've been in, in solar, solar farms. Uh, so it, it can run the whole gamut of our businesses, Aslinda. But where are conversations? And if you take a look at a time frame of perhaps 12 to 24 months, might we see uh, some collaboration between the two sides in some of these areas I, I, that you mentioned? I, I expect that. I expect that. I mean... Having celebrated uh, 50 years of, of, of partnership, I mean, all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the uh, conversation between the two sides is, is much more intense and much more focused. Uh, Mint, this Mint deal has a way of, of getting people to focus. Uh, you know, Mint, is, is, it, it connects a lot, of, uh, a lot of companies in our ecosystem. It, uh, it will take advantage of uh, what Mitsubishi and MUFG have to offer. Uh, there'll be a lot of, uh, of ancillary business coming out of, of this Mint investment. Uh, with the investment from Mitsubishi, are you still trying to push through the IPO for Gcash? That has always been the plan. Does that remain the plan? And when might the plan materialize? Well, right now it isn't clear to me that, uh, that Mint needs, needs a, a whole lot of cash. Um, so I think uh, we'll continue to look at options uh, going forward. Uh, obviously, an IPO remains a possibility, uh, but you know the the times got to be right, the markets have got to be right, the regulations have got to be right, and the company should need uh, uh, should have use of the funds. So all of those things have to come together for an IPO to take place, and and we'll see. We'll, we it's something we we think about and and we look at, uh, but time will tell. So not within the next six to 12 months, no IPO for Gcash in the next one year. I, I, you don't need the cash. And no, never, I, I wouldn't say never. I wouldn't say no. I'd say it's something that we're trying to explore. I mean, you know, the markets can change. You never know what, what opportunities might come up. Uh, it's something we, have, we, we keep an open mind to and we talk to our partners in the company about it all the time. Mm. We know that Ayala has talked about divesting its non-core businesses. It wants to raise a billion dollars on the back of that. Where are you with that? Well, fortunately, we've done it. We've raised over a billion dollars uh, in, in, in value realization transactions. And, and uh, we've taken some of that billion dollars and we, and we, we invested it into Mint, uh, which, which has the Gcash app. Uh, so it's a process that, that continues. Uh, uh, we are uh, we are getting a more concentrated uh, portfolio. Uh, you know, our big businesses are are, are doing well. Uh, we'd like to to increase the capital uh, we put in the big businesses when, if if they need it. 
Uh, if, if some of our younger, more nascent businesses are doing less well, uh, uh, we'll either take, take capital away from them if, if we don't think they have traction, or we'll uh, realign them and, 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 and make sure they do well. Uh, so this value realization exercise that we've done uh, is, is obviously key to uh, restructuring the whole portfolio. Some murmurings out there that you may sell a stake in Ayala Healthcare. Can you confirm that? Is there, are there conversations happening? Well, conversations around Ayala Healthcare are happening all the time. I mean, this is a company that, <laughs> that isn't that old. It's a, it's a very exciting company. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's got, a, got a real ecosystem. It's got hospitals, it's got clinics, it's got drug stores. Uh, it's actually growing quite quickly. Uh, and, uh, and, and people have expressed interest in taking a piece of it. It's something we look at, uh, we look at regularly. Uh, you know, if, if a deal happens, uh, you know, obviously it will happen uh, for the good of the company uh, and its shareholders. Uh, you seem to be quite confident in terms of uh, uh, your funding, but there's still conversations about whether or not you might go back to the bond market, whether domestically or internationally. Uh, are there plans to, to raise uh, more funds? I, I think most of our funding uh, needs for this year are, are, are covered, Haslinda. Uh, next year, we're looking at, you know, maybe 25, uh, uh, 25 uh, billion pesos or so, call it 500 or so million dollars uh, in, in financing needs. And we've got, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got financing lined up to cover that. Um, so we're, we're well covered. As a matter of fact, this year, uh, the amount of financing, uh, of new financing we took was, was even higher. And uh, interestingly, uh, a lot of that was in the form of sustainability type financing. Uh, the Ayala Group as a whole has raised almost $6 billion in sustainable uh, type financing. Uh, so that's very exciting. Mm. Where will growth come from in the next 12 to 24 months? Which business well, will drive that growth? I'd like to say almost all our businesses, Haslinda. We're, we have the benefit now of uh, good GDP growth in the country, 6%, maybe more, and relatively low inflation. The last inflation print was, uh, was only barely 2%. Uh, and that's a nice combination for our businesses. So I expect the bank to do quite well because even with, uh, with uh, narrowing uh, net interest margins, volumes are going to continue to grow. Uh, I expect our, our real estate, the yellow land business, to do quite well because obviously real estate is very interest rate sensitive. Uh, I expect our telco business to do quite well because the prepaid component of telco is very sensitive to inflation. So anytime you have price mm. stability, obviously the prepaid business uh, does well. And then ASEN, which is our renewable energy company, um, you know, it's, it's got a big balance sheet. It's, it's growing quite quickly and, and finance, financing costs obviously very important. So, so, you know, low inflation, low interest rates, uh, a big boon uh, to ASEN. And then for all our smaller right. businesses, uh, our, our smaller businesses are quite, uh, a lot of them are quite price elastic. So anytime you have price... Uh, you talk about uh, rates. Of course, we had the BSP good. easing rates by uh, 25 basis points. Is that shaping your thinking? Well, it's, it's, it's helping me become much more positive about the outlook. Uh, look, the BSP has done a couple of things. They've, they've lowered reserve requirements uh, by, by uh, 250 basis points, and, and they lower the policy rate. And, and that tells me they're feeling very confident about inflation. That tells me they're, they have a, 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 they're looking, we're looking, we can look at a growth agenda. Uh, and that tells me we can put more money to work in our businesses. What are the expectations? Will the BSP move another 25? Will it move 50? Some saying perhaps 50 by the end of the year. Our, our, our economists, uh, Slinder, are thinking maybe another 25. But whether it's 25 or 50, uh, to me, that, that doesn't really matter. What matters is the direction, all right? And the direction is, 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 is downward, and that tells me inflation is under control. That tells me we can, we can think uh, in a more growth-oriented way. That tells me we can be more aggressive, we can put more money to work. Uh, that tells me, you know, we, we, we probably should be putting more, more, more capital in our businesses. Right. 
So much optimism, Bong, but there are risks out there. We know that we're seeing increasing tensions, perhaps uh, in the South China Sea between uh, the Philippines uh, as well as China. How big a concern, how big a worry is that for you and your businesses? My biggest geopolitical uh, concern, Haslinda, is actually oil prices, Middle East. All right, uh, mm. high oil prices will hurt a country like ours. Uh, high, high oil prices might be more harmful than, you know, high rice prices. Uh, so uh, if you talk about geopolitical concerns uh, in the Middle East and, and what it does for oil prices is, 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 is my primary concern right now. But what oil price would start denting your business? It really depends because you know the 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 uh, the energy Bong intensity. Well, put a number to it. Uh, maybe fifty percent higher would be my guess. Fifty percent higher would mm. would obviously begin to hurt. Mm. How closely are you watching the U.S. elections then? Oh, no more closely than anybody else. Uh, it's it's fascinating to see uh, the U.S. democracy at work, uh, but but I suspect. Uh, the U.S. is looking at a soft landing regardless, and that's probably, uh, it, that probably means a good U.S. economy. It means and that a good U.S. economy would be good for the world. And given, given tensions within the U.S. and China, Bang, I mean, my companies in the Philippines get caught in the crosshairs of the tensions between the two sides? I, I, I hope not. I mean, we... Look, we 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 all have to gain uh, with you know, uh, with good trade, uh, with 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 solid supply chains, uh, with calm uh, geopolitics. Uh, I hope not, uh, you know, because for the Philippines, I think we're looking at you know two or three or four good growth years, and I hope geopolitics doesn't derail that. The thing is, Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines have benefited from, uh, you know, China plus one strategies that countries, uh, companies are now adopting. Do you see the Philippines continuing, uh, you know, to, to get those inflows from that? Well, I, I think the Philippines is, is, is trying to get inflows from everywhere, right? Uh, internationally, uh, from the West, from the East. Uh, fortunately, we have a very consumption-driven economy. 20% of the economy is, is really inward remittances plus BPO revenues. Uh, and that kind of uh, concentration, that kind of structure, insulates us a little bit uh, from, from what happens abroad. Obviously, there's no perfect insulation, but it's, in, in times like this, it's good to have a consumption-led economy. Bong, thank you so much for your time. Stay dry. This is our consent, president and CEO of Ayala Corp. Now, coming up, McDonald's is grappling with a severe E. coli outbreak in the U.S. that's killed one person and made dozens more sick. We'll have the latest. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. McDonald's is in focus after the U.S. CDC linked its hamburgers to an E. coli outbreak. Bloomberg reporter Avril Hong joins me now with more. This is bad news. What do we know? Yeah, we've heard how dozens have fallen sick um, and one person with underlying conditions has died. We know how the CDC is telling us that, you know, it might take a while before the full extent of the outbreak can be known because there might have been some that recovered without even being tested. And the locations that are worst affected are the ones in Colorado as well as in Nebraska. Uh, for McDonald's, what it's saying so far is... It seems like they've managed to, in a way, narrow it to one supplier of its onions, and it's also pulled off the menu its quarter pounder. Have a listen. The decision to do this is not one we take lightly, and it was made in close consultation with the CDC. It's important to note that the majority of states and the majority of menu items are not affected. Other beef products at McDonald's, including the cheeseburger, hamburger, Big Mac, McDouble, and the double cheeseburger are not impacted. 
So comments there really from the chief of McDonald's seeking to reassure consumers and perhaps investors as well uh, that they are working towards keeping this contained. Well, even as it tries to contain the situation, investors are not liking it. I mean, the stocks were impacted. Yeah, they certainly punished the stock. We saw it post-market. It tanked as much as 10%, although it's pairing some of those declines. If these losses hold when markets reopen, that would be the steepest decline since March 2020. And going forward, the investor reaction, I think, is going to be very dependent on how McDonald's actually responds to this outbreak. So far, we've heard from one of its uh, supply chain officers that is working with the CDC. Uh, but we also know how these things can be really tricky. You think back to 2015 when Chipotle was dealing with the E. coli norovirus outbreak and how long its sales were affected. There were fines also that were imposed. Uh, for now, we have the likes of Bloomberg Intelligence saying that the worst of the impact for sales and traffic, that's going to be likely for this quarter, but it could stretch as far as the fourth quarter of next year in terms of pressure on sales. The thing is, it is a very challenging time for McDonald's, right? I mean, it is about consumption. Consumers are up in arms right now. Certainly, it is facing challenges to its business, but there are also some other things that I think has drawn scrutiny. I mean, you think about Trump's appearance at a Pennsylvania outlet and, you know, serving food, working the drive through working the fry station. Uh, so far, McDonald's has tried to kind of distance itself from the politics. It's, it's not taking sides. Uh, we also see under scrutiny because of its price hikes, right? Uh, something that, that has actually outpaced the pace of inflation as well as input costs. And we hear earlier this week how the likes of Elizabeth Warren asking for information on McDonald's pricing decisions. So I think this latest outbreak just adds to the challenges for the company. you got to say that Trump serving fries was quite a sight. Now, speaking of consumption, Starbucks also in the news. Yeah, so it is a tricky time. I think uh, whether you're talking about McDonald's or Starbucks, they're both facing a pretty challenging environment. McDonald's has said that, you know, 2025 is going to be another challenging year. It's offering these $5 value meals. But we see how it's coming against a backdrop of consumers that have just been hit by inflation for a number of years. They're just not biting. Uh, for Starbucks, that's affecting their business in the US, but China business also getting affected. You think about how it has suspended guidance for next year. The most recent report, we saw how the sales really plunged twice what uh, analysts had been expecting. And for the Chinese business in particular, it's also facing tough competition. Uh, you think about how other local coffee chains like Luckin, right, they are uh, serving up coffee at a much cheaper alternative. So I think this all speaks to the trends of how consumers, whether you're talking about the US or China, they're just tightening their belts. Not easy being in F&B mm. now, Huss. You're right. I mean, consumption is key. Hopefully, those fiscal, fiscal stimulus would help in consumption in China in particular. April, thank you. Now, before we go, here's a look at how uh, our guests are looking for tomorrow. We'll get insights from Lombard Odier, Asia CIO. We're talking about John Woods. He'll be talking to us about the global macroeconomic trends and why he thinks more rate cuts are coming. Plus, LinkedIn CEO Ryan Roslansky joins us exclusively to talk about the latest labor market market trends, as well as the impact of AI. That is it for Insight. Horizons Middle East and Africa is next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.